Hello everyone, uh, this is Vishwabandhan from IIT Kanpur and I'll be talking about our recent prefetching technique called Bouquet of Instruction Pointer. This is a joint work with uh, Samuel Pakalapati from Intel. Before we jump into the details, let's have a quick summary. A prefetching framework is based on the control flow, which is also known as the instruction pointer. We perform training at the L1D and we bring the prefetch blocks both into L1D and L2. Our framework is extremely lightweight, demanding less than 1 kb of hardware overhead. And within 1 kb, we perform equally well with the state of the art prefetcher, providing 45% performance improvement over memory intensive fake CPU 2017 benchmark. What is the problem that we are trying to solve? Well, the problem is pretty famous in the field of computer architecture. It's known as the memory well problem. As you can see, the CAS access latencies are in tens of cycles, but DRAM access latency is actually more than hundreds of cycles. So minimizing this costly DRAM accesses is critical for the performance. And goal is to hide this DRAM accesses as much as possible. What is the ideal solution for this problem? Well, if we can have a prefetcher that can prefetch everything into L1 and provide an L1 hit rate of 100%, then the memory all problem will be solved. However, the state-of-the-art prefetchers are mostly proposed at the L2 and they prefetch till L2. Let's look at the opportunity available in the field of hardware prefetching. So in this plot, as you can see, the state-of-the-art prefetchers are providing performance improvement up to 40%, but if we look at the perfect L1D prefetcher, it provides a huge performance improvement of more than 120%, which shows a huge gap between the state-of-the-art prefetcher and the perfect L1D prefetcher. Next, let's look at what's the utility of prefetching into the L1. So in this plot, we are showing performance improvement when the prefetcher is at the L1, prefetcher is at the L2, and at a case where the prefetcher is at the L1, but it fills only till L2. Note that we are not showing performance for all the prefetchers because some of the prefetchers which are proposed for L2 are not fit for the L1, for example, the delta-based prefetcher. So as you can see, in all these prefetchers, prefetching at the L1 improves compared to prefetching till L2 or prefetching at L1 but filling till L2. This shows that prefetching at the L1 is actually a promising idea. Let's see what are the benefits of having a prefetcher at the L1. As you can see, L1 is the closer to the processor and it's the best place for observing and learning the memory access pattern, which are unfiltered, because compared to L2 and L3 that gets filtered access, L1 sees the request coming from the processor code. Secondly, if we have a better L1D prefetcher that can aggressively hide the memory latency, there is no need for L2 prefetcher, and L2 prefetcher can become super close. Prefetching at L1 is also full of challenges. For example, the L1D cache is already bandwidth starved, and it's heavily ported. So if a prefetcher wants to check whether whatever it wants to prefetch is already there in the cache, then it needs another port to access the L1D, which can hamper the bandwidth starved L1D. Second point, the L1D is actually highly critical in terms of latency and the look of latency is just few cycles, let's say three to four cycles. So the prefetcher should be extremely agile so that it can learn and prefetch within those three cycles. Finally, the number of MSHR entries at the L1D is limited compared to L2 and LHC, which limits the degree of a prefetcher, meaning the aggressiveness of a prefetching, it can't prefetch beyond the limit because the MSHR entries will create a bottleneck. State-of-the-art prefetchers are actually tuned for specific memory access patterns and because of which they demand significant additional storage for just covering a few outliers. For example, prefetchers like SMS and Bingo demands more than 100 kV of hardware overhead to improve the prefetch coverage. Instead of proposing a new prefetcher, we proposed an IP classifier that classifies an IP into four classes. The classes are constant stride, complex stride, global stream, and where none of the 
things work, we classify our IP as unclassified and we just go for a simple next line prefetcher. So this collection of four classes create a prefetcher that works on four different access patterns like strides, complex strides and global stream. And in future, more and more features can be added on top of this IP classifier for better temporal prefetching or better prefetching for let's say uh, graph application or any pointer changing applications. Our first IP class is called the CS class or the constant stride class. This is same as an IP stride prefetcher where for a given IP we store the strides observed for that IP where the meaning of a stride is the difference between accesses in terms of cache line addresses. The CS class does well when the strides are constant. However, when the strides are non-constant, as you can see in the form of plus one, plus two, plus three, and minus three, where none of the strides are recurring for a given IP, say IP A, then CS class fails to prefetch. In this case, we propose a complex class or we classify an IP into a complex class where we store the strides as a signature and then we probabilistically determine what will be the next stride given a sequence of stride that we call as a signature. So in this example, you can see IPA has a signature of plus one, plus two, plus three, and two out of three times, the output says it should be minus three. That means whenever IPA gets plus one, plus two, plus three as the stride, it should prefetch with the stride of minus three. Next, we propose an IP into a global stream class. The global stream class corresponds to an IP that drives all other IPs within a particular region, say an OS page. So in this example, as you can see, XX plus one is driven by IPX, YY plus four is driven by IPY, and Z followed by something driven by IPZ. So a per IP based prefetcher as CS class or complex stride class can actually help but to improve the timeliness and coverage further, what we can do is on a first access to IPX, we should preface the entire region irrespective of the IP. So in this case, IPX becomes a global stream IP that drives all other IPs in that particular region. To understand the global stream class in a better way, let's take an example. In step one, you can see accesses to cache line x, x plus one, y, y plus one, and z, where the first access is driven by IPX. So in step two, we store all these accesses into a buffer called global history buffer. And if we find there are more than n by two entries in the global history buffer for that particular region, we make this particular IP as a global stream saying it, it's a valid global stream. And if we find that there are more than three fourths of GHB entries are getting hit, then we call it a strong global stream. So in future, if IPX comes, then it actually looks at the direction of the stream, meaning whether all the accesses are actually going in a positive direction as seen in the step one, or if it is in the negative direction. Once it knows the direction, and it knows that the stream is strong, it just prefetch all the conjugative cache lines in that particular region. Finally, if we fail to classify an IP into one of those three previous classes, we use the next line prefetcher. But instead of using next line all the time, we call it a tentative next line, which is used only when the L1 misses per kilo cycle is low. Otherwise, we don't use the next line prefetcher. Let's look at the entire framework. In this case, we have an L1 access with the address, the virtual address along with the IP. So first it goes to our framework using an IP tag. And if it gets a hit, next it tries to find out which class this IP belongs to. So in step number two, it compares whether the particular IP belongs to a global stream or constant stride, which is CS and GS. In the case, if it doesn't belong to any of this global stream or constant stride, it tries to find out whether there is a possibility of complex stride, 
that is a step three. And in the case, it doesn't find anything in the complex thread also, it goes for a tentative next line. The priority of our classes is global stream followed by constant stride, followed by complex, and then next line. The rationale behind using global stream is global stream can preface the entire region uh, effectively, and that improves the row for hit rates at the DRAM. As you can see, the preface degree is high in case of global stream compared to the constant stride and complex stride. So the priority and the aggressiveness. We don't propose a prefetcher at the L2. However, we communicate the classification information that we have learned at the L1 to the L2 prefetcher. So we communicate the class type and along with the learned stride and the stream direction to the L2 prefetcher. And the L2 prefetcher can just store the class type and the learned stride and stream direction to further prefetch. In this way, there is no learning needed of the L2 prefetcher the, as the accesses are already filtered by L1. However, it still gets the better picture about the memory accesses. Please note that we don't prefetch uh, the CPLX class at the L2 because the CPLX class is actually for the non-constant stride and we don't get better utility by prefetching CPLX class at the L2 because L1 is already taking care of most of the non-constant strides. With this, let's look at the performance that we get with our framework. So our framework is named as IPCP, the Instruction Pointer Classifier Based Prefetcher. And here we are showing performance for memory intensive spec benchmarks for different prefetchers starting from next line till bingo. As you can see, IPCP only at the L1 outperforms all the prefetchers except bingo, but bingo demands 119 KB, whereas IPCP demands only 0 0.72 KB. Next, when we communicate the metadata from L1 to L2, so IPCP framework both at L2, L1 and L2 provides a performance improvement of 45% for the memory intensive traces and 22% on the entire spec CPU 2017 suite. The insight that we get after using the L2 prefetcher is that the utility of L2 prefetcher is negligible because IPCP at L1 was almost improving by more than 40% and the utility of L2 prefetcher is just 3 to 4%. Next, let's quickly look at the prefetch coverage, which means how many misses are covered because of our IPCP framework. We are showing the prefetch coverage at both L1 and L2 along with the LLC, even if we don't have a prefetch at the LLC. As you can see, on average, IPCP covers 60%, 70%, 80% of L1, L2, and LLC misses, but there are applications like MCF and few irregular applications like Omnet PP and XZ where the coverage is really low or it's negative. These are the applications where we fail to learn the access patterns and a temporal prefetcher can help to improve the coverage. Next, let's look at the coverage provided by each class. As you can see, we are showing coverage for all the four classes but on average, GS and CS classes contribute almost 80% of the total coverage. However, there are applications like MCF where CPLX is actually doing good. And there are applications like Omnet PP, Perl Bench, and Jalan where the tentative NL also does good. So overall, if we look at the utility, each class has its own utility. However, GS and CS class contribute the majority of the coverage. Next, let's look at the utility of the priority of the classes. As you have discussed, we prioritize global stream over constant stride and complex strides, and that performs better as we have discussed before. It improves the row for hit rate, and it improves the aggressiveness in which it prefaces the entire region. However, if we do the other way around and prioritize CPLX over GS and CS, then there is a huge performance degradation of around 9%. We also perform well in case of multi-core workloads. Apart from cloud suite for which we need temporal prefetchers, in rest of the suite we are equally effective.
So in summary, we propose an IP classifier that is based on the control flow. We call it a bouquet of IP prefetchers. We choose a hierarchical priority among four classes that we propose. The classes are coordinated among themselves and which provides extremely lightweight modular framework that provides high performance. We thank our funding agency through SRC and uh, Intel Labs. The source code of this framework is available at the following link. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the live Q&A session for the talk titled A Bouquet of Instruction Pointers by Dr. Bisavandan Panda. I am Krishnendra Nathala, and I'll be moderating this session. So if you have any questions, please use the Slido panel on the right of your screen to ask them. So um, let me first thank Dr. Biswa for his excellent presentation on the lightweight uh, and high performance data prefetching solution. Uh, it is also my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Biswavandan Panda. Uh, Biswa is an assistant professor at the computer science department uh, of Indian Institute of Technology at Kanpur. His area of research primarily includes microarchitecture for performance and security. So Dr. Biswa, thank you for joining us today. Hey, thanks, Chris. Um, uh, thanks for this. Okay, so I think uh, we are having poor connection from your side. So if it continues, I'll let you know and we can. Uh, but looks like we have one question already. So let's start with the question. Uh, great talk. Uh, what is the overall accuracy of the solution and what are the accuracies of the individual components, specifically the CS, CPLX, GS, and NL? Okay, I'll repeat the question. The, it's about the overall accuracy of your solution and of the individual components specifically as well. What is the accuracy of uh, CS, CPLX, GS, and NL? Yeah, so what I was saying is uh, CS and GS classes are actually uh, of high accuracy, uh, followed by CPLX and NL. So uh, okay. if, if I remember correctly, the accuracy numbers are around 60, 70 plus for CS and GS. And for CPLX, it was uh, less than that. And for NL, it was even lesser. Uh, so that, that's okay. why we don't use it uh, continuously. We use it uh, once in a while, depending on the MPKC. Okay, okay. Um, so kind of a follow on to that question. Um, do you have some kind of a throttling mechanism and is it a per component or is it a global throttling mechanism across all of these components together? Yeah, so we have a throttling mechanism which is per class. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a pretty simple uh, throttling mechanism based on accuracy. Uh, so, which, which eventually uh, becomes a global throttling mechanism. So, we uh, make the throttling decisions per class, but if none of the classes uh, behave properly or they, they are not effective, so eventually the entire framework stops or, or uh, it becomes conservative in terms of aggressiveness. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I was thinking, uh, are you aware of the perceptron prefetch filtering work and do you think... Uh, a more advanced prefetch filtering could enable to squeeze more performance out of your solution, probably just allow all of your components to be very aggressive and then have this uh, other mechanism to uh, kind of catch the useless prefetches. Um, the, the problem that currently uh, we are facing is we are doing everything at L1. Mm -hmm. And uh, the framework that we have used, uh, Champsim, uh, that is not sensitive to cast pollution. So that's why uh, even if we are uh, prefetching some junk, we are not able to see its effect in the IPC. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, perceptron is a good idea for L2 prefetcher, but doing it at L1, uh, it may be like uh, too much, right? Because the L1 size is tiny. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, if, if we have to do it for L2, then uh, yes, we, we can do that. Okay, yeah, sounds good. So yeah, let, let me just uh, request the audience to post any questions you might have on Slido so that we can have Dr. Biswa answer it. So another question I had was how much uh, performance do you think we can squeeze more out of this? Like you said, you could um, combine this with other components like a temporal prefetcher or a pointer prefetching solutions. Have you given it a shot and does the IP classification mechanism really work with those as well? As in, can you identify that class 
correctly and have have the component work. Yeah, we have just yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so yes, uh, this question is a valid question. Even uh, uh, we we have mentioned it uh, in our presentation also. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have tried uh, the uh, simplest temporal prefetcher, right? The irregular stream buffer from Akanksa mm -hmm. Jain. Mm -hmm. uh, I can uh, give you some preliminary numbers. Mm -hmm. It seems it's working for the irregular ones, the uh, the, the obvious ones like MCA, Omnet, PP, and those kind of benchmarks. And uh, so I think the idea will be to find out the IPs which are uh, needed only for the temporal ones where, where you can get uh, extra benefit on top of uh, this bouquet instead of training the temporal one for the entire application, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so that filtering mechanism should be more accurate uh, so that the temporal ones will uh, start giving more benefit. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so one of the biggest uh, drawbacks, as you might be aware, for temporal prefetching is uh, the lot of metadata. And as you spoke, the real concern that would be not storing everything, all kinds of metadata, but only that which is not covered by your other uh, components, right? So is, is that yes, what yes. you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah, that'd be quite interesting if you could get it all to work together at, in a lightweight manner, it'll be quite impactful. I don't know how, how lightweight it will be uh, because temporal <laughs> ones are really heavy. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I also uh, remember reading in your paper that um, you don't deal with uh, page crossing prefetches, right? Or, or do you have a mechanism to handle that as well? No, so th in the paper, we didn't have uh, cross page prefetching, but it can be easily done, right? Because we are mm -hmm. operating at the virtual address space. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can actually move ahead and uh, do a pseudo TLB prefetcher uh, along with the L1D prefetcher, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, you have to be a bit careful because it may result in a page fault and uh, that time you have to mm -hmm. stop uh, prefetching. But but yeah, cross-page prefetching will work uh, really well for uh, this global stream and uh, constant stride class mm -hmm. because the strides they keep repeating across the pages, right? So uh, it will be good in terms of timeliness. Mm -hmm. Yes, but um, I mean, a page fault might not necessarily be a bad thing, right? You might actually be detecting a future page fault and basically getting it out of the way quicker. So, not sure, right? I, it may lead to uh, security and isolation issues also. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Something <laughs> is always a concern. Um, so, yeah, it looks like uh, the CS and CPLX components could avoid cold misses, but from your explanation in the presentation, does GStream also help capture cold misses or does it have to learn a whole page and only when you come back to the page, you kind of prefetch it or is it linked to the IP? No, no. So you, even uh, GS can uh, eliminate the cold misses, right? So uh, the way it works is it finds out whether the page is dense or not. So uh, in the definition of uh, denseness, it may happen that certain cache lines are not accessed before, but because you have already uh, classified that page as dense, so you will prefetch almost everything, right? Sequentially. So the, that will, uh, in a way, uh, eliminate the compulsory misses too. Okay. Because you are, just, uh, you are just dealing with the direction of the stream and not necessarily what cache lines you are going to prefetch, right? Okay. During the training. So you're just learning the IP and the direction in which it, the IP travels. Uh, so basically, even if it goes to a new page, then you kind of, once you detect, this, detect it as a GS IP, then it just uh, triggers the high degree prefetch in the direction that you've noted. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. sounds good. Um, yeah, just one last question. Um, does your, so you, how does unlearning work in, in, your, uh, in your IP classification? Is that like something that's inherent with the training mechanism or do you have some kind of epoch uh, based solution? No, so it is uh, inherent, right? So we, we don't have any epoch based mechanism. So, uh, so the IPs come and go and uh, based on the dynamics of uh, IPs, right? The way they behave, uh, the learning uh, come and go, right? And uh, whichever mm -hmm. IP behaves to a particular class, if, they, if, if it sticks to a particular class, then it will continue behaving in that particular class, right? Uh, but yeah. but yeah, it's, it's dynamic by definition, right? So it, there's nothing yeah. called static. Mm -hmm. Yep, so it makes it uh, such that it can react to the different faces in time as well. So yep, 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 yeah. 
Yeah, even if there is a phase change, you, you can be reactive and uh, start, start getting into a new stream or uh, stride or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, Viswa, that was the last question. Thanks a lot for joining us today and for the excellent talk and answering these questions as well. Thanks, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. Thank you.